Hello, welcome to another Tweedy Pubs video. I'm in Oldgate today. I had a suggestion in the comments that I should do a little bit more of the east end of London. So I'm starting here, right on the edge of the city of London. We may not go far beyond the bounds of the city of London today, but it's a start. Pub number one, the Hoop and Grapes. This is a listed building and historic England site that it is probably late 17th century, which slightly calls into question the claim that the pub is one of the very few timber buildings to have survived the Great Fire of London in 1666 and still be standing today. None of the timber posts are really quite straight. Over the years, the building has tilted sideways by 18 inches. That's just under half a meter. One of the things I like most about the exterior is this pair of carved posts and they have gilded vine motifs. There are bunches of grapes on there consistent with the name of the pub. There are also a pair of what I believe to be parish boundary markers. One of those appears to be for St. Botolf without Oldgate and has a date of 1782. And the other looks to me as though it's for St. Mary Whitechapel. There are a couple of hanging lanterns at the exterior and one of them has the number of the building, 47. The sign for the pub is probably not old, but it has some nice wrought ironwork around it and a good depiction of the hoop and grapes. There are a couple of different competing theories about where this name comes from. This is not the only pub in the UK called the Hoop and Grapes. One theory is that it is a derivation of hop and grapes, suggesting an establishment that serves both beer as well as wine. And the other is that it may simply be down to the fact pub signs were often ring shaped or hoop shaped and the emblem of the pub was displayed inside that ring or hoop. Inside, I don't know if there's really a huge amount of old material on display now. Of course the beams are of some considerable age we assume but other than that the bar counter and the rest of the fixtures and fittings all look quite modern and, and anyway they're not likely to have gone back further than 1920 or thereabouts. There are some partitions around various parts of the pub. I don't think they're sort of traditional pub style partitions but probably relate more to the era when this was used as a wine merchant, more of a shop. There is a lot to talk about in the history history of the hoop and grapes and some sources even claim that there may have been a pub on this site going all the way back to the 13th century. I'm going to take all of that with a large pinch of salt and just focus on the parts of its history which can be clearly supported with documentary evidence. Most sources state that it was converted from its prior use as a wine merchant in 1920. I think the conversion might have actually been slightly earlier than that as the earliest newspaper mention I could find was from October 1918. That stint as a wine merchant is a surprisingly long one, spanning quite possibly 150 years. It was Christopher Hill wine merchants from at least 1841, possibly all the way up to 1918. That was the name on the front of the shop for at least some of that period, and it's interesting that that sign also mentions the prior owner, Henry Newton, going back to around 1783. A bit further back than that is a Sun Fire Office insurance record held at the London Metropolitan Archives all the way back in 1782. That has the owner listed as James Stracy, and tantalizingly, the business is actually named as the Hoop and Bunch of Grapes at that time. Prior to 1782, earlier directory listings just show the address and the name of the wine merchant, which is listed as Thomas rather than James Stracy. I think the Stracy family were all involved in the wine and spirit trade. James was possibly the older brother, who may have been the owner of the property, with Thomas, the younger brother, installed to do the day-to-day -day running of the business. There was also a third brother, John, who ran a distillery near Smithfield Bars. The earliest record that I was able to find of a member of the Stracy family at this site was from a directory listing in 1772. Prior to that, the trail runs cold. Some sources mention that the pub was formerly known as the Angel and Crown, and although I did find some records of an Angel and Crown in roughly this area, I couldn't find any clear evidence that it was this precise location. In the 1740s, an Angel and Crown in Whitechapel was used as a meeting place for the committee of what we now know as the Royal London Hospital, and the location was cited as 
Whitechapel bars, that's a reasonably good fit for this location right on the edge of the City of London. In the 1730s, the vintner and philanthropist Benjamin Kenton, also known as Ben Kenton, had his apprenticeship at an Angel and Crown in Whitechapel, but at least one source cites it as being on Goulston Street, which is very close, but it's at the north side of what we now know as Whitechapel High Street, so the location to me doesn't feel quite right. Go back to 1708 and there is a book called A New View of London which describes the parish bounds of St. Botolph Oldgate using the Angel and Crown as a point of reference. That could be referring to this location. Hard to make a clear connection with the Angel and Crown but if anyone does know of any records that clearly link the Angel and Crown to this location 47 Oldgate High Street then I would really love to know. It's a Nicholson's pub today. Here's a look at the lineup on the bar. I had a half of Timothy Taylor's landlord. Pub number two, the White Swan. Cheers from the White Swan. Another listed building and Historic England notes that it is from the early 19th century. I think most notable at the frontage is this bay window. It has some etched glass in it, but I'm fairly sure that's modern. It looks like may come from a refurb around the 1980s. At one time, there were painted tiles at the entrance with a picture of a swan. Alas, that seems to have gone some time ago, even though that is mentioned in Historic England's listing. Some quite nice wrought ironwork on the sign up above the awning there. Inside I found the bar back quite attractive. It has an arch supported by columns with a clock in the middle. There are a few stubs of partitions dotted around, one on the side of the bar counter. There's also an old telephone next to that. There's some wood panelling on the walls and some old prints. On a weekday lunchtime this was a nice quiet pub and quite a contrast to the Hoop and Grapes which was surprisingly busy. Here just a few drinkers and by the time I was leaving I was the only person in there. The earliest records over on the London wiki site for this pub go back to 1809 and the earliest newspaper mention I could find was from 1847, a fatal fall at a sugar baker's. I think sugar baker is another word for sugar refiner. Whitechapel was at one time a big area for these. John Sebastian Helmken grew up here. His parents ran the pub. He moved to British Columbia in 1850 to work as a doctor and he played a significant role in the province joining the Canadian Confederation. His parents had moved here from Germany and at one time in the 19th century the Germans comprised the largest foreign community living in London and it seems many of them lived in the Whitechapel area, possibly because it was close to where the steamers from Hamburg would have arrived at St Catherine's docks. In the 1970s the Half Moon Theatre was located about three doors down, taking its name from Half Moon Passage, which is next to the pub. The White Swan was remodelled in the 1980s and expanded into part of the former site of the Half Moon Theatre. There was an old shop that they used as a box office for a time. It is a Shepherd Neem pub today. I had a half of Spitfire. Haven't had that for quite a while. It was quite pleasant, actually. Pub number three, the Princess of Prussia. The current building dates to 1913. It was built by Truman's Brewery and likely by Arthur Edward Sewell, their in-house architect, whose work we've encountered before at the Stag's Head in Hoxton. Pevsner said of Sewell's pub designs that they usually sport attractive faience decoration and domestic architectural motifs. And I think both of those are in evidence here. So you can see that Truman's hand and Buxton Brewery livery very much still in evidence on the frontage. There's that broken pediment at the roof level. There's that bay window on the ground floor with some etched glass in it. Green tiling to dado height at the ground floor. Some ionic pilasters. One of the things I particularly liked about the exterior were the corbels that were topped with carvings of what I assume to be the Princess of Prussia. Inside there is matchboard panelling on the bar counter and two stubs that possibly give hints to an earlier layout when it may have been more separated. It's a very homely sort of interior. It has a very nice old fireplace towards the back, surrounded by horse brasses and a bedpan and things of that ilk. There is an eclectic collection of knickknacks hanging from the ceiling ceiling and some bits of the walls. I'm always a fan of these, including several model aeroplanes, a collection of hats, the usual old water jugs, plates, 
a fairy liquid washing up bottle, tin of Heinz baked beans, a thermos flask, the list goes on. The pub was named for Victoria, the eldest child of Queen Victoria, who married Prince Frederick William of Prussia, later Frederick III, Emperor of Germany, for a mere 99 days in 1888. They were married in 1858. The premises was initially licensed as a beer house in around 1859. The earliest newspaper article that I could find is from 1891, at which time it was still referred to as a beer house, and there was another example of a German-sounding name at the helm. The landlady at the time was one Mrs. Kuhl. Pub number four, the Brown Bear. This is another listed building, and Historic England cites the facade as being early 19th century. It has a Taylor Walker sign at the top. It is predominantly yellow brick. There are four Doric pilasters on the first or second floor in simple stucco. Brass letters on the sills originally to the window, but they weren't particularly visible today. I couldn't quite make them out. The pub sign of the bear is quite attractive, I think. Two entrances now. One of them has city bar above the door and the other has saloon bar above the door. At first glance it looked as though there might have been a third entrance in the middle but on talking to the lady behind the bar it seems as though that is in fact just the cellar hatch. Also interesting are the grills above the windows and apparently they were installed at a time when of course there was still smoking in pubs and that helped to ventilate the internal space. Inside, the brass footrails are also mentioned in Historic England's listing. There is a curved, slightly sloping bar counter, which to me looks quite interwar in style. Some quite attractive glazed panelling and more carved wood above the bar counter, and also some very attractive lamps on brackets suspended from the gantry. Some traditional pub games to be found here. It still has a dartboard on one side, and there's also one of those tabletop top arcade machines playing Space Invaders and possibly Pac-Man. One thing I found interesting were these screens around the tills. Also on one side of the bar I noticed a set of hinges. Why exactly it needed to be hinged so that the whole top of the bar counter could flip over I couldn't quite fathom. I rather liked the brown bear. It was nicely unspoilt and um, another one of those pubs which is a little bit of a geezer's pub. There are records of a Masonic Lodge meeting being held here as early as 1754. The earliest newspaper mention I could find was from 1803 about the landlord at the time rather tragically dying from a cat bite. Given the area, we of course have to touch a bit on the Whitechapel murders and Jack the Ripper. The museum is only a few doors down from here, and it was close to here that the final murder attributed to that spate of murders was committed in 1891, and there is plenty of newspaper coverage of that. On a slightly lighter note, in 1898, there is a newspaper record of the fact that the pub had apparently become a centre for trading in canaries. Once again, interestingly, a German connection here, as most of those canaries were at the time imported from Germany. The Brown Bear is an independent pub. I went for a half of Sambrook's Junction. Pub number five, and OK, it's not technically a pub, but bear with me, Wilton's Music Hall. This is once again a listed building. Historic England suggests it's probably mid 19th century. Somehow the exterior and to a certain extent the interior of Wilton's Music Hall always reminds me of Venice. That kind of peeling plasterwork, the slightly crumbling buildings, the faded grandeur, the shabby chic if you will. The main entrance is flanked by pilasters and they have what Historic England describe as a bas relief of flowers and fruit. There's also a large Windsor lamp hanging over the doorway, although I think that is more modern. I think this is a fantastically atmospheric exterior, and it's helped by the fact that this is a purely pedestrian alleyway, so it isn't spoiled by the usual cars and vans parked outside. On the inside, obviously the main attraction is the theatre part itself. Alas, on my visit there was a matinee, so I couldn't get inside that bit. So we're just going to focus on the bar here. The bar is absolutely shabby chic on steroids. There's some very nice carving on the beams overhead, matchboard panelling on the ceiling, 
thing. The frontage of the bar counter is quite eye-catching. It was, in fact, I'm led to believe, a prop made for Sherlock Holmes' A Game of Shadows, which is a movie from about 2011, I think, that was filmed partly here in Wilton's Music Hall. It was a cast, a plaster cast, made based on the balconies that you can still see in the actual theatre part. This is a very rare example of a surviving music hall, and particularly one that was converted from a one-time pub. We've seen examples of this before at the Eagle in Hoxton. There was apparently an alehouse on this site, possibly going back to the 1740s, and it was known for a time as the King of Denmark or the Prince of Denmark. From the 1820s or possibly 1830s, it took the name Mahogany Bar, although I suspect at least initially that was more of a nickname. I found a newspaper mention from 1881, at which time it was still being referred to as the Prince of Denmark. However, earlier in 1845, there is another newspaper mention of a time that the entire building collapsed, and at that point in history, it's referred to as the Mahogany Bar. Various stars of the Music Hall era, like George Laybourne, better known as Champagne Charlie, performed here in its heyday. So the part of the building that now constitutes the Theatre Bar still retains the name the Mahogany Bar, and I think there is actually a great bit of continuity from its former use as a pub. It only opens around the times that performances are on. Okay, well that's it for the day. I think by the end of that walk I was no longer in Oldgate anymore. Toto. Some pub interest to be found in the area around Oldgate. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.